Welcome to All About Money on HK. IBC. I'm Clay Fong. In the signal that Beijing is trying to prop up the lukewarm property sector and ease the burden on homeowners with a mortgage, China has cut the five-year loan prime rate by 0.1 percent to 4.2 percent. The one-year loan prime rate, a medium-term lending benchmark for corporate loans, was also cut by one-tenth of a percentage point. While slightly below market expectations, the cuts have rekindled hopes of more stimulus measures to sustain growth. Economists and analysts are also calling for reforms amid dwindling returns from the traditional growth drivers. So are we going to see more inventions from Beijing? And how can authorities dispel the pessimism within the private sector? Joining us today to analyze the situation is Wang Dan, chief economist at Housing Bank China. So Dan, welcome back to our show. It's great to have you again. Thank you. Firstly, let's talk about the latest rate cuts. The latest LPR cuts, if fully implemented by commercial banks, would lower the household burden by dozens of billions of yuan a year, based on the existing mortgage loan size of nearly 40 trillion yuan. But, you know, as we mentioned, the cuts were lower than market expectations. So what is your view of the latest measure? Do you think it can really help boost the real estate sector and also to shore up demand? Uh, first of all, the rate cuts is the right direction. And the market has been crying for it for a long time. Uh, finally, the rate cuts in the interbank lending rate in the MLF and finally in the LPR fits what the market is mostly needed, and that's the good thing. But then, as you have pointed out, uh, it is way too late and a bit too insufficient. People are not buying new homes, not because the mortgage rate is too low, but because there is a general loss of confidence on China's economic outlook. And now this expectation cannot be reversed by the 10% percentage point of rate cuts. And LPR cuts in general now cannot really boost the demand because China is in this liquidity trap equivalent. Even if there's further cuts in interest rate, it may not uh, reverse the demand, domestic demand in particular. Um, but we still expect more cuts uh, in the coming months, although might be in smaller magnitude, because the balance sheet of the household sector and corporate sector needs to be improved. Their debt burden can be lowered if interest rate is lower. Right. And also, uh, uh, tell us, why do you think authorities didn't choose like maybe higher rate costs, but instead chose the more conservative measure of adopting the 10 basis point rate costs? Well, the short answer is the authorities are well aware that by just the rate cuts, it wouldn't really help revive the domestic demand. It could prop up other problems because the main focus in the past two years is trying to contain financial risks. And part of that is linked in um, the different problems in the housing sector. And for authorities, they don't want to prop up the housing crisis again. And now, although the price is falling, if they do more aggressive measures, it's very likely that a lot more money will just rush into the housing market and drive up the housing price again. And they do not want to see that. And another reason is the one I mentioned briefly, it's the liquidity trap. Right. Uh, once the, the, the economy is in this situation, it doesn't matter how much rate cuts you have, it just wouldn't really boost the confidence. So actually the economy needs more liquidity, and that means probably the price, which is uh, the interest rate, may stay the same, but there needs to be more money flowing into the system. So basically quantitative easing is a more appropriate way to reverse on the pessimism in the economy. Mm. And now many are awaiting, for example, the July Politburo meeting to see if there will be broader, like more stronger stimulus package. Do you think we'll really be seeing like stronger package of stimulus measures in, for example, next month? Well, I don't think there will be more aggressive measures. Uh, one simple reason is that reaching the 5% the GDP growth target is still very, uh, I shouldn't say very, relatively easy job. Just by a natural rebound in consumption and a relatively uh, strong investment in manufacturing and infrastructure, China can probably reach the 5% growth target or even above that. And for authorities, they might want to ease the burden of debt 
and improve balance sheet uh, for household and for corporates, but they do not wish to give it expectation that it will uh, it will rely on those traditional measures to boost the China's economy again. They want to do more reforms, uh, and they would like to have a strengthened supply chain rather than a popped up uh, consumer price or uh, housing housing sector. So the expectation and management of the economy is different from before. Uh, economic security is prioritized way higher than in the past decade, and people should have a rational expectation of this. Right. And, uh, uh, you know, also many economists are also, like you, calling for a stronger, uh, like, reform if possible mm -hmm. later on. Credit numbers are also not looking good. What do you think is the outlook for the demand for the debt moving forward? Well, the debt are mainly from three sources. Uh, we have seen that uh, the household debt is uh, falling, and that's mostly linked with a weakened housing sector. Mm -hmm. um, and we probably won't see improvement in that front and anytime soon. And for the debts borrowed in um, the corporate sector, and people do want to wait a bit further to see whether there are more opportunities in overseas market or domestic market before they take long-term loans. Um, and the domestic sectors have very different views about the economy. If we're looking at the new energy sector, they're quite optimistic still, um, especially for the overseas market expansion. And there is still a lot of momentum in borrowing and lending. But for the rest of the economy, although there were a lot of policies trying to prop up um, their borrowing, it's very hard for them. And for local government, they simply do not have the incentive or appetite to borrow. Uh, because as we can see, the fiscal burden for most of the local governments are very high at this point. Right. And uh, we, we briefly mentioned about the supports on the corporate loans. But uh, you also mentioned about consumption, which is a key focus for this year. And uh, we've talked about support on corporate loans, but what about the consumers? Uh, since last year, like you are in Shanghai, since la last year we've, we've seen the Shanghai COVID lockdowns. And from that point, you, including you, have also suggested authorities should you know, issue more stimulus measures, for example, the consumption vouchers to support consumption. But then authorities didn't really issue such measures. What do you think are the reasons that the Chinese authorities didn't so far issue these kind of vouchers to give a stronger shot in the arm to boost consumption? Um, there is a strong role played by the mentality because Chinese economy is regulated and managed in a very different way from the Western economies. China, by nature, is still a producer, not really a consumer yet as a whole. And as a producer, the policies way prioritize corporates and factories um, rather than consumers. And in the past 30 years, we haven't seen any major stimulus package targeting to give cash to consumers, even during the most severe downturns after COVID. And now, although there is a real need, or uh, I would even say this is probably the easiest way to reverse uh, market expectation and to boost confidence, and, but for most governments, they are not used to this measure. They still want to see money being spent on building stuff like building infrastructure, since it can be used again and again and generate future benefits. But for consumers, if you give them cash, they can only be spent once. And if this mentality doesn't change, then I don't see a change in the policy. Probably on the margin, the low-income families can get some sort of targeted help uh, down the road. But still, I don't think the magnitude will be very big. Do you think authorities should, should change its mentality then? And also maybe, do, would you say, for example, lowering the income tax could also be one of the solutions to boost spending as well? From economic theory, it would be the best way um, to just give consumer cash if you want to boost the short-term demand immediately, because that will have a very instant effect especially for those small and micro companies in services sector in big cities. Uh, once the consumers start to spend, their business will improve immediately and the market sentiment will have a, uh, will have a 
almost an overnight change once that happens. Um, but for government, they have other concerns. Um, they do prioritize economic security, and that means uh, their policy targets won't be on the consumer sector. Um, would there be better ways to really help the consumers uh, other than giving cash? Uh, at this point, I just don't think so. Um, cutting the individual income tax might help a very small share of the population. But as we know, only 4% of Chinese population pays individual income tax. So the policy can only benefit a very small amount of people. Right. And on another aspect, for example, if we look at the private sector, uh, we're also seeing a quite vicious circle, isn't it? Because uh, the private sector, which employs more than 80 percent of urban workforce, has been suffering from slowing economic activities and the weak confidence. And because of the current economic downturns and soft demand, corporates are also reluctant to hire. So now we're seeing like 20.8 percent of youth unemployment in China. And because of the weak labor market, consumers are reluctant to spend. So this circle just, uh, so how do we, how can we be able to break this kind of like vicious circle then? It's very tricky now, isn't it? Uh, it is quite tricky um, because for young people, the unemployment rate has always been quite high and it has been the highest of all the age groups. Uh, that's not a surprise. But what's surprising is that uh, the young people's unemployment has reached over 20% earlier in the year. Usually this only happens in the graduation season, uh, like in July or August. So we can only anticipate more unemployed young people uh, coming out in the market. There is certainly a mismatch in the skills those people possess, because for many of the companies in the market trying to recruit uh, talents, they also have a difficult time. Um, especially in the sector of artificial intelligence, uh, new energy, even for on the factory floor. They need high-skilled blue-collar workers, but China's education system produces a lot more people that are suitable for the white-collar job, uh, like in finances, uh, sitting in the office for IT company, uh, or mid-level programmers. And there's an oversupply of those talents, but undersupply for other mostly needed skills. And that's some long-term problem that needs to address. But in the short term, I do believe that the state sector and the government have to play a bigger role in absorbing more of those young unemployed workers. Right. For example, would subsidies, as you also suggested last year, be able to work to solve, like to, to be able to be a short-term solution then? for the well, companies the, to hire talent? Uh, subsidies for companies can help to improve uh, employment figures only on the margin, because for private sector in particular, they need to survive first. Then this year, uh, what we have observed is that there has been this wide restructuring effort across the board in the private sector. It doesn't matter which industry you're in. And that restructuring simply means to lay off workers. Uh, get rid of the redundancies. And uh, we do see uh, new, new, recruit, new recruitment still happen, but in a much smaller scale. So expecting the private sector to employ more people uh, in this economy is unrealistic, uh, unless there are some programs that can directly connect uh, those corporates with, say, universities so that they could almost indirectly train those students to become the future employees for them, like the German model. Um, but now we don't have this link. And then for the people getting into the job market, they still have to do this mass uh, marketing or uh, just uh, trying to see their luck uh, in different companies. I don't think it's necessarily the best year for any graduates to enter the job market but they might have to um, just endure this difficulty in, in their early career. Got it. Thank you very much for your thoughts, Dan. Let's take a short break for now. But coming up next, we'll have more dis discussions on China's economic outlook. So don't go away.
Welcome back to All About Money on HKIBC. I'm Chloe Fong. Joining us today to analyze China's economic outlook is Wang Dan, chief economist at Housing Bank China. So thank you very much, Dan, for joining us. Earlier, we have briefly mentioned about the latest rate cuts, the consumption issue in China, and the private sector sentiment in China. And now I also want to talk about the, uh, another trend, which is the inflation issue in China that is going on the very opposite direction in comparison to the Western economies. So we're seeing the inflation is nearly at zero percent growth, mm -hmm. with 0.1 percent growth in April and 0.2 percent growth in May. With this trend continue, do you think we should be worried about the risk from deflation in China? Uh, the price levels are certainly very low now in China. Uh, whether we're in a deflation period is the uh, question in debate. Um, but from uh, from where I stand, it just looks like the domestic demand cannot improve drastically in the coming month, which means the downward pressure in the consumer sector, at least, will persist. Um, the low inflation environment will be quite detrimental to economic growth. It's probably even more so than inflation, because once the price level is low, it is linked with wage growth and income growth. And now we're already seeing the bonus cut, the wage cut across the board. And this low inflation just means in the future, the wage growth will be even lower than now. And that's going to hurt the consumer sector. But at the same time, for companies, they will not produce more when the prices are going down. They will only produce more when the prices are going up. So in order to encourage the corporate to invest and to produce, the at least the expectation for inflation has to go up and that means the monetary easing is probably very much needed uh, in all different measures right now we're very conservative in the monetary policy for good reasons but down the road it might be necessary to see more relaxation do you think we could potentially see some monetary easing uh, next month or in the second half of the year I think there's very likely to be more monetary easing in the second half of the year. Uh, for next month, it might be too soon, uh, since we we do observe that uh, the monetary policy has been quite conservative and quite cautious. And depending on um, the bank borrowing and lending, and depend, depending on how fast the housing market is recovering, it just doesn't look like there is necessarily uh, urgency to cut rates or do money expansion again next month. Um, but towards the end of the year, because the job market pressure is mounting up and more companies in the private sector would need liquidity to run their business. Since people are conservative about their spending, then many of the small businesses lack liquidity. So they do need more um, from the banking system and that requires more monetary easing. Right. And uh, also on the local debt, we're now seeing the debts are also piling up on the local governments. And there's no official data on the existing scale of hidden debt. And many people think that, oh, we, we've been here before. But uh, do you think the notion on the current status is not systematic, is likely to change in any way in the future? And uh, especially now with more trickier situation we're seeing right now with a downward, downward pressure? Well, so the local government debt is certainly not a new problem. And I don't think it's going to be a trigger for any financial crisis in China. Um, even with the current debt level, uh, depending on how you estimate it, uh, it's very high, but it's still contained. One big support for that is China has huge regional disparity. And the central government is still in very healthy fiscal stance. So currently, most of the borrowing are done at the local government level. Many of them have relatively low credit ratings. But if the central government could take up more borrowing in the bond market, for example, then their credit rating is very high. They can borrow at very cheap, a very cheap rate. And that could help the local government debt and potentially resolve it once and for all. But now I think the real concern is actually on growth, not on debt. Since local government is constrained on how much money they can spend and what kind of project they can take on, 
then the local growth is going to be probably even slower for central and western China. Um, many of the infrastructure done in the past 10 years turned out to be not profitable at all. Then taking on more projects only means the local officials have to take more responsibilities in the future once those projects, if they go sour. So um, I think the focus really should be on what could be a new engine for local growth rather than whether those that could bust. Because the short answer is, and I think most market participants believe, the local government debt is quite a severe problem, but it's not deadly. All right. And speaking of the outlook in China, many are also calling for structural reforms in, in the country because now we're seeing the returns from traditional growth drivers are losing steam. We're seeing the old playbook is not suitable for the current cycle now. So what do you think would be, poss be the possibilities that the central government could redesign its policies to achieve now we're setting a long-term growth target of more quality growth. But also, at the same time, we can also ensure the cyclical decent amount of growth. How could we achieve this kind of balance? Oh, well, the short-term pressure mainly exists in the job market. And the government need to design better mechanism to uh, resolve the issue for especially the young people and the migrant workers. But for the long-term growth engine, uh, I think China is down on the right path. It has to rely on innovation in the future rather than investment to boost the economy. Uh, right now, most of the capital uh, within China are directed into the so-called high-tech sector, trying to uh, directly invest in the high technology or to automate the traditional industries. I do believe this is a necessary step and it is the future. It is, the only thing is that this process doesn't generate much jobs. Uh, since the new technology will require a lot of capital, it's capital intensive, but it doesn't require a lot of the workers, especially low skilled workers. Um, and during this deep transition, uh, we will see some structural uh, unemployment happening along the way. And for different industries, they will also see different prospects. Um, new energy, new material, advanced equipment making, they have been receiving the most attention uh, and the best policies in the past few years. Um, and in the future, I believe this trend will deepen. And maybe 10 years down the road, we'll see a quite new industrial landscape for China that's centering around those high-tech sectors. And for the labor-intensive industries, they will be slowly, slowly moving out of China uh, to ASEAN, uh, to Middle East, or even Latin American countries. So um, I do think that China still have the long-term growth potential. It's just that in the next few years, during this transition, uh, we wouldn't see the kind of high growth that people were used to in the past 20 years. But when we think about the individual uh, suffering or what, the, uh, what each family has to endure in this process, it does mean that we need a better social safety net to ensure um, the social welfare of the lowest income groups. And they are the most vulnerable during this transition. Thank you very much for your insights, says Dan Wang, chief economist at Hansing Bank China, who joins us from Shanghai. And thank you for watching. All About Money will be back next Sunday night at 8.30 p.m. So until the next time, please take care.